This is fake. But where is the real Ark of the Covenant? And who is the Indiana Jones of today? Well, allow me to introduce you to the three people who claim to have found it. Number one, Rabbi Yehuda. In 1982, Rabbi Yehuda and his friend Shlomo Goren conducted a risky, secretive archaeological dig. Why did they have to be so private about it? Because they were digging beneath the Temple Mount, and above the Temple Mount are a number of sacred religious buildings which hold a lot of value and meaning to religious groups around the world. But the two men say that they broke through into the Western Wall and and there they found an inner chamber that went back 28 meters. And at the bottom of this chamber was the Ark of the Covenant. Both the men say they saw the Ark, they were feet away from it, but they refused to touch it. But one day they claim when the Jewish temple is rebuilt, they will bring the Ark of the Covenant out and show it to the rest of the world. But whilst these excavations and these digs are going on privately, a radio company got wind of it and they leaked the information across all of Israel. By by morning, there were great big groups of rowdy, angry people saying, how dare you dig beneath the Temple Mount? And as you know, the situation in Israel is still very tense. That's why no further excavations have been able to take place ever since. But what do you think? Do you think Rabbi Yehuda really found the Ark of the Covenant? Well, stay tuned because I would like to give you my opinion of where I think the Ark is today. Number two, the monks of Aksum. In a tiny little chapel in Ethiopia, there's a group of monks who claim they have the Ark of the Covenant. There are a number of different stories about how the Ark arrived in Ethiopia, but the point is this, this group claim that they hold on to one of the most sacred objects in world history. Now, there is a problem. The problem is this, the monks are so secretive about it, they will not allow any other outsiders to enter into the chapel, and there is just one guardian monk who is allowed to look after the Ark and set his eyes on it. Why is this such a problem? Well, it's very hard to test their claims. And one man, Edward Ullendorf, the professor of Ethiopian studies, he actually says that he did get an opportunity to set his eyes on this supposed Ark. And he said it was nothing more than a wooden box. A wooden box that was built in the medieval period, long after the biblical era. So again, I'll ask you, where do you think the Ark of the Covenant is? Do you believe it's in Ethiopia? Because I know for a fact some of you will not be expecting my answer to this question. Number three, Ron Wyatt. Ron Wyatt is one of the forerunners who discovered Noah's Ark in Jurapanar, Turkey. But did Ron Wyatt find another Ark? Did he find the Ark of the Covenant? Well, Ron believed the location was at what is supposed to be the garden tomb, just next to Calvary. That's where he believed the Ark was located. So he gained permission and he began to dig at the garden tomb. And there he found a passageway. And what Ron claims is directly beneath the cross holes, directly beneath where Jesus Christ died, that is where the Ark of the Covenant was found. And when Ron says he found it, he said he also met four angels who told him, yes, take pictures, take videos, but keep the footage there in the chamber. And at the appointed time, that is when you will reveal it to the rest of the world. Now, it's difficult to say whether Ron really did find the Ark of the Covenant, because we don't have the same body of evidence that we do to some of his other discoveries. But again, over to you. Do you think Ron Wyatt is the man who found the Ark of the Covenant? Well, I think my answer is going to shock you in a moment's time. But first, we need to answer the question, why is this? This one of the most important objects in the world to both Christians and Jews alike? Well, firstly, it's because it was designed by God. God had given very specific instructions of how the ark should be designed. It was to be overlaid both inside and outside by gold. At the bottom were attached four golden rings, and through these rings went poles of archaea wood, which meant that the priest could carry the ark when it was necessary. But most beautiful of all was the atonement cover, or the mercy seat. On either side of this mercy seat stood two golden cherubim with their wings spread out. And this was a sign that these two cherubim obeyed God. They had attention facing into the mercy seat, facing where God met with the people and they obeyed only him. But what do you think was inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Well, it had the Ten Commandments, the very commandments that were written by the finger of God. And also inside was Abraham's staff and a jar of manna 
manner which reminded the people of Israel that God provided for them when they were wandering in the desert for 40 years. But here's why the ark was so precious. You see, if I could sum up the Bible, if I could sum up all 31,000 verses in the Bible in just one word, what word do you think I'd choose? Atonement. And the ark of the covenant represented atonement for the sins of the people. Let me explain it to you. You see, the ark, its natural resting place was in the temple, was in the tabernacle of God. And the tabernacle was a very holy place. But in the tabernacle, where the ark was, there was a curtain which separated it. And behind the curtain from this already holy place was a place that was even holier. It was called the Holy of Holies. And no one could enter behind that curtain except for the priest. And the priest couldn't just enter any day, any day that he felt like it. No, he could only enter one day a year on the Day of Atonement, which was called Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, when the priest entered in there, it was a very precious day because it says in the Bible that as the priest entered into the Holy of Holies, their God met with him. Their God hovered above the ark of the covenant. But listen to me, meeting with God is very different to if you and I met. You see, the priest, the high priest, had to go to very special measures before he met with the Lord. He had to bathe himself, he had to put on a special garment, and then he had to sacrifice a bull as a sin offering for his sins and for his family's sins also. And once he had the blood, only once he had the blood, could he go behind the veil and meet with the Lord. And with the blood, he would dip his finger and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Once the high priest's sins had been dealt with, then he could proceed into making a sin offering for the people. So he took two goats. The first goat he sacrificed, and just like he did with the bull, he took the blood of that goat behind the curtain, and there he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat as a way of appeasing the wrath of God. For the many sins that the people of Israel had committed, there the blood was shed, because our sin is worthy of death. And then with the second goat, he took that goat and he laid hands on the goat's head. And there as he did that, there was a sort of process, a spiritual act of the sins of the people being transferred onto that goat. He then called an appointed man and that appointed man took the goat into the wilderness and let it go free. And as that goat ran away, it took the sins, it removed the sins into a far remote place, far away from the people. And that is where we get the term scapegoat from. Now, before I reveal to you my opinion on where I think the ark is today, can I ask you a question? Do you see it yet? Can you see it? Does anything I've just said sound familiar to any other amazing act that happened 2,000 years ago? Well, perhaps this Bible verse will drive it home for you. Unlike the other high priests, he, that is Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Now do you see it? We have a new high priest, a great high priest, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not have to bring before God a sin offering for his own sins because the Lord Jesus Christ was totally sinless. He was righteous and he had done nothing wrong so he could stand before God boldly and say, I am sinless, I present the sacrifice. This great high priest, he did not have to keep entering into the temple once a year to offer a sacrifice for the people. No, when Christ Jesus hung on that cross, when he was nailed to that tree, that was one sacrifice, once for all, that is eternally sufficient to pay the price for all of our sins forever. And as a brother once said to me in a church, the blood of Jesus Christ is eternally cleansing us from our sins. And the next thing you need to know is this, the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not enter with the blood of an animal. No, he presented his own blood before the Lord God. That blood was there to appease the wrath of God. So the wrath that abides on you and I, the wrath for our sins where we stand before God, condemned for our lies, our sin, our blasphemy, all the wrong things we've done. That wrath was turned away 
and placed on Jesus Christ and there he absorbed it so that we could be forgiven and that blood can wash us white than snow. The Lord Jesus Christ that day did away with all animal sacrifices. No more did lambs need to be sacrificed, no more did bulls need to be sacrificed because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And something that probably comes to your mind when I say about the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, is that great big curtain, that great great big veil that went from the top of the temple down to the bottom that separated the holy place of the temple from the most holy, the holy of holies. What happened when Jesus Christ cried out these three words? It is finished. The curtain was torn in two and that is the most beautiful sign that now you and I, a sinful, vile people, can enter boldly into the presence of God. The way is open because God, the mediator between God and man, God, the middleman, Jesus Christ, in a flesh, he met with us so that we could now enter before God and we're no longer separated because of our sin, because Christ paid the price for our sin. He was the sin offering that we need. So the only thing I need to ask you is will you come? Will you come and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Saviour? Will you ask him to bring you into reconciliation with God? To bring you back? You've been separated for so long because of your sins, but today you can be drawn back to the Father through that very act that the Lord Jesus Christ did. If you want it, you can have it. Just like that goat was sent miles and miles away because it took the sins of the people away into a remote place, so the Lord Jesus Christ can separate your sins as far as the east is from the the West, they can be gone and it's yours if you'd like it today. But if you refuse it, well then the wrath of God abides on you and you will be a child of wrath and one day you will endure the punishment for your sins in all of its fullness in hell forever. And that really is the only reason I make these videos because I do not want you to go to hell. I want you to find the forgiveness that can be found in Jesus Christ. Okay, you've waited long enough. Where do I personally think the Ark of the Covenant is located today? Well, I don't want to offend anyone, and just know this, I don't have the monopoly on truth. This is just my own personal opinion. But I do find it very interesting that from the point of 2 Chronicles chapter 35, never again do we hear about the Ark of the Covenant in all of Scripture. And what we know from world history is that in 587 BC, the Babylonians besieged the the city of Jerusalem. They took it over and they destroyed the temple and set the whole city ablaze. So one theory is perhaps the ark was destroyed. But another school of thought is this. Some people believe that the prophet Jeremiah was warned by God that this was going to happen so he took the ark of the covenant and he hid it in a secret place. Now we have to be very careful with this theory because nowhere do we read of it in the scripture. But suppose that is the case. Suppose it is hidden somewhere somewhere beneath the earth. Personally, again, I'm not sure that we will ever find it. Because do we really deserve to find it? Here we have a world that is so fallen, that is so depraved, that is so in touch with dark things and we promote so many wrong things. Do we really deserve to handle something as sacred as the Ark of the Covenant? I don't think we do. And as I said previously, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Ark of the Covenant, although it was precious at that time, we don't need it anymore because we have a new covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. And really, that's enough for me and I hope that's enough for you too. But if you are an atheist and you do have have big questions and you want more evidence, here is the number one question that atheists always ask me. Check out this video because I hope it will answer it for you once and for all.